So I'm going to take you guys through um, our development of the uh, air ECMO uh, and ground ECMO transport at UAB. So I have, uh, start out, I have no final uh, financial disclosure. The ob objectives for today is going to be to discuss the need for ECMO transport, <laughs> describe the processes for planning, training, implementation, and success of an ECMO transport program, discuss the protocolization of ECMO transport standards, explain the differences between primary and secondary ECMO transport, illustrate the proper techniques for training and education for an ECMO transport program, and finally discuss the contrast between air and ground ECMO support. So we're all familiar for this uh, slide. First uh, patient treated, 71, trauma patient. Um, and, you know, luckily for us, we don't have the uh, enormity of all the, uh, the various uh, oxygenators and tubing and everything that, that you see here in the picture. So we're able to uh, transport patients that are on ECMO. So I was uh, burdened with the task of uh, planning and providing uh, support for ECMO transport program. And so I started doing a little research. This is the first picture I came across. So I started thinking maybe I should pick somebody else to do it. Um, very intimidating, a lot going on. Of course, this is military transport, probably some of the first uh, that were done. Um, but fortunately, like I said, we've, got, uh, we've gotten a lot better equipment and uh, and things now that um, uh, we were able to successfully pull this off but uh, so where do we begin so I'm glad you asked uh, why do we want to ECMO or transport our ECMO patients so first of all um, you can have risk of patient uh, deterioration during conventional transport a uh, patient placed on ECMO in an outside hospital that doesn't have the resources to be maintained long term patient who may need VV or VA ECMO to stabilize them for transport to a center for uh, uh, orthotopic heart and lung transplant. And then finally, a presence of an air leak syndrome that will worsen with high positive pressure ventilation and altitude. This is an uh, article that I found basically just kind of looking over uh, the success rate or the um, success versus failure of patients that were transported uh, or just placed on ECMO at a, at, a, at a center. And they found that there was no overall difference in survival at six months between retrieved and ECMO center patients. So, um, the um, Columbia University uh, put out a paper of their 100 ECMO transports. Uh, and they said that the ECMO transport can be performed safely and reliably, reliably with excellent outcomes with a dedicated team that maintains stringent adherence to well-designed management of protocols. And this, as you'll see in the next few slides, is very important. Finally, is ECMO transport safe? This is uh, a European study that was done, and they actually showed that after um, they reported out of 1,481 um, ECMO transports, which reported two deaths, they compared it to the CSER trial, which patients were transported without ECMO support, Two of their 90 patients uh, were dying, died during transport with an overall mortality rate of 2%. So the patients that were transported on ECMO were actually more stable and survived. So I started with ELSO guidelines. These are available for everyone, and this is kind of where I start most of my um, uh, research. There's a lot of information there that's important um, that people have come together and put this um, information there for us to use. So. Uh, it was very, um, very helpful uh, in starting to uh, look into this type of um, modality. So what we had to start doing was, first of all, start talking to the different interdepartmental uh, people, planning meetings, uh, setting timetables, which you guys would know is very important. Starting to discuss the imponderables with those guys. Um, we have a very um, uh, uh, busy critical care transport team. Uh, they were very structured and they were very helpful. So we started talking about the effects of flight, um, gas exchange and cabin pressure, altitude, uh, where we could store our disposables, where we would have to, um, how many personnel we could take. We looked into the uh, use of ECMO equipment and how we could better use that equipment in uh, either ground or air transport. 
interhospital coordination with other departments, um, patient selection, and then of course we had to start training. So we had to train the critical care transport team and start teaching them about ECMO. We also had to teach them what to do in an emergency because they weren't used to this modality. So they would spend time with me in the unit and then I would spend time with them lecturing and doing didactic training and wet lab training as well. Then we had to take the ECMO staff and start training them to do critical care transport. So we had to get our team familiar with their team and vice versa. Medical privileges for critical care transport seems to be the, the Achilles heel of the program that takes the longest. Uh, sp more specifically, the cannulation privileges for other hosp um, outside hospitals. Outside hospital communication is important. They need to know what you need once you get on the ground and get there. Um, and they need to know how to support you and, and um, once you arrive and how to better support the patient. Finally, you want to look at whether or not you want to do air transport versus ground transport and what those differences are when you want to take an aircraft versus uh, just taking an ambulance. ELSO protocols, we looked at the financials and then last but not least, we had to look at the liability for the hospital. Planning, well, we have a well-established ECMO and transplant program. We were doing probably uh, at the time, we were doing over 100 ECMOs a year. Uh, we were ambulating the patients, and I guess as a victim of our own success, we thought, hey, this is a great idea. Let's jump on a plane and fly, take these patients from point A to point B. We have uh, institutional foresight and support, which is very important. We had the, like I said, a well-established critical care transport program. Uh, we had a very good medical director, uh, surgeon and ECMO physician that could go with us on transport. We had the proper equipment, we, training and education for the transport team. We had uh, very dedicated clinicians that were interested in this being successful. And then finally, you gotta have gas money and snacks for the trip, right? So we developed standards and protocols for the hospital. Um, this incorporated what our job were to be, the medical uh, director's job would be, the ECMO physician on transport, the critical care team, where we would sit. We, we, we broke it down basically um, and, and had a very detailed protocol of what we would do during emergencies, how we would go about the transport. This is an extremely important tool, something that can refer to um, back to, uh, of course it has to be revised uh, routinely, but nonetheless, uh, it's important, especially when you're talking about uh, two different uh, teams doing this, uh, a similar job. And then of course, when you have new hires, uh, it's important to have this for them to review. We uh, primarily use the cardio help um, and cardio help disposable and console. We have a transport uh, holder that, that this mounts to. Uh, and then we typically, um, depending on the patients on ECMO or not, we will take our own cannulas with us we will also take disposables and backups for this equipment as well. We have the room, so fortunately we are able to take that with us. Some other equipment that other people are using, uh, the, there's a McKay Rotoflow that you guys I'm sure are aware of that can be used. Uh, it's important to note that not only the McKay but the Rotoflow uh, both have um, hand cranks so that you can uh, provide uh, support during an emergency or a disposable failure. We got uh, Centromag, we do have that in-house, but we don't use that for ECMO transport. They do have an ECMO transport uh, holder that that fits into. Uh, the, unfortunately for this type of equipment, there's no hand crank, so your only, only problem uh, is when using that is you have to just change out, take another controller with you so you can change it out. But very good machine. Uh, we like the cardio help as well because it has the, the interventions and safeties. And then uh, some people are even using, this is in Europe, not available in the States yet, but the Meadows Delta Stream uh, is a very good option, I think. Uh, it's something I'm very interested in in the future. So when I started, <laughs> you basically had to uh, put yourself in the, uh, in the role of the clinician. So we parked everything in the ambulance and I sat there and with our team and tried to come up, make lists, of imponderables of what we would need, what we would do if things go wrong, 
um, how much room we had to take our disposables and equipment. Um, we would have to figure out what the visiting, when we were at the visiting hospital, what kind of ambulance they had, what size it was, would it fit everyone, will we have to take two ambulances. Uh, we got so specific that we would even call ahead and make sure they had the heater running because uh, sometimes we would transport in the wintertime. So. Um, but that's, that's kind of where you start. You can see here that um, cardio help puzzle. This is where we started out with the uh, initial holder. We basically mounted it to the side, but we, uh, the evolution of this, we uh, had the respiratory therapist, um, they had their, resp uh, their ventilator mounted to the front of the stretcher. And so we had, I took over, went over to the machine shop and had a guy build a, a pole that this would mount to. So it would go either on the, um, the head if you were doing VV or the foot if you were doing VA. Uh, peripheral VA. So um, luckily for me, I can't take all the credit. Uh, this is Matt Tyndall. This is my MacGyver. Uh, this is the guy that uh, thinks outside the box and is an awesome clinician. Very, very helpful. But this is us loading up our victim. And uh, we, had a, we had one of our ACMO specialists uh, play the role. We actually got the CCT people to come pick us up. We mounted everything just like we were going to be transporting a patient, took them out to uh, the airport. So this is our ambulance ride to the airport. Then later, ProPAC, this is our cardio help up here. It's another shot of the, the inside the, the um, ambulance. Important to note, and the guys are, I've done a lot of ECMO like we have, you, there's a lot of imponderables of, of just unplugging the power, unplugging the gas, plugging it back to, up to another source. So you have, you have checkoffs, and, um, which is very helpful when you're, when you're doing this kind of thing, just to help you remember so you don't forget to turn the O2 on. So this is inside, this is after we've loaded inside the jet, there's a ramp that comes down, we're able to load the patient in, and this, the pole that we uh, mount the cardio help holder, uh, transport mount to, swivels back and forth. So as you're going through the jet, you can make sure that you make this turn and get clearance so that you can get the patient in there safely. Again, this is just our dry run, this is just us just trying to run through what we would need as far as equipment. Again, CCT is used to sitting in certain spots, and of course we had to evade, uh, invade their space. So, um, you know, this is where the respiratory therapist normally sits, and because of where the cardio help is uh, placed on transport, we would have to take over this seat. So what they did is they took the ventilator and they just they moved it over so that they could sit here and we just kind of reverse spots. But again, it's important to note that. You know, when you're doing this kind of thing, these everybody's territorial in healthcare, so it's important to work with these guys. And just, they were very giving, uh, and we're very fortunate for that. They would allow us to, you know, sort of invade their space and, and, and help them. But they were very also very hungry for the education and the experience of, of doing this. So it's a very important. The other thing that we did while we were out at the um, uh, at the airport with these guys, twice a year they have emergency training for the aircraft. So they put us all, they black out all the windows, for example, they fill the cabin full of smoke, and then they have you go through the emergency process of taking the door down, jumping out of the aircraft. Um, we do a survival training where we, and I'm going to say this, uh, we all take turns at eating crickets. Make sure you pull the legs off, by the way. Um, but we do, we do all of that, so it's, it, to me it's fun. Um, you, you know, you learn about fires on aircraft, you learn about survival training, and what you do in the event that you were to crash. Uh, this is our ECMO team. You're looking at about, uh, I don't know, close to 100 years of experience there. So uh, it was important to have these guys because, again, they really do a good job of thinking outside the box um, and planning this stuff um, so that it goes well. As you can kind of see, is you're kind of tightly fit in there like sardines. Um, we have protocols for de-airing the circuit in case we were to pull air into it. 20,000 feet, you know, the, the idea was, hey, well, you know, we just need to take a backup circuit with you. Um, it's not very feasible to change out a circuit 20,000 feet, so you gotta have ways 
to de-air this circuit and resume ECMO. Primary and secondary ECMO transport. This is something that's uh, in the in the ELSO information, but um, the situation in which a transport team is required to perform cannulation at the hospital, the visiting hospital. Uh, so this will be a, a, a patient that needs ECMO and you're transporting, uh, you're going to the hospital and putting the patients on. The, but primarily, most of the patients we do are secondary ECMO, although we do have, I think we're on the verge of getting privileges for our uh, surgeons to cannulate at other hospitals. Um, the other uh, scenario would be secondary ECMO where you, you pick the patient up that's currently on ECMO and then transport them to your center. Um, most of the time this is for just bridge to transplant. ECMO equipment that's needed, this is just a small list, but um, you need to be thinking about your console, your power cord, hand crank, backup console, O2 supply in the ambulance and the aircraft or just the ambulance if you're doing ground. Mounts, disposables, transport bags with your various, um, maybe you got to have clamps and fluids and IV tubing and various things that this critical care transport or the ambulance doesn't provide. And then you got to think about VV cannulas, VA cannulas, um, to try to figure out, do you need to take cannulas with you? Is the patient gonna, uh, gonna you're gonna start out VV and then have to like Linda said, you have to start out with, with, with one modality and you wind up with three or four different ones. Coordination of dry runs when you start to train uh, is important. We, again, if you don't have that critical care transport staff and you're doing by ground, then you gotta set up some sort of um, scenario or training with the, with the ambulance team. Didactics for each member of the ECMO team and ECMO, wet labs for each member of the ECMO transport team and your critical care transport team. Emergency drills with the critical care team to be familiar, familiar with the aircraft and ambulance safety because that's, because that's important. Take a team approach to roles and treatment during interhospital uh, ECMO transports. Creating real life scenarios will, will help best prepare the staff and use the actual equipment, transportation vehicles, disposables, and a management employee that you're gonna be using when you're actually transporting these patients. You just help um, with familiarity of the, of the uh, transport equipment. Outside hospital transport, this is probably the most overlooked, but the evolution of our transport um, sort of eluded to better communication. Starting out communication with a coordinator on the ECMO transport team. Outside hospital calls them, they start planning and start all the phone calls. You've got to find out if you've got a bed in the unit. You've got to find out if you've got the, 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 the surgeon that can go. You need to find out also, do we need to go put this patient on for primary uh, ECMO transport? Is it going to be secondary? If they're already on and all supported, then there's probably not the need to rush out of the hospital and get there as quickly. Ultrasound and fluoroscopy, if you're gonna do VV, like, like Linda was alluding to with the Avalon, if you're gonna be placing an Avalon. Cartery, heater cooler, do they have a heater cooler there? Uh, just, if, if nothing else, for you just to warm your circuit if you're gonna be putting them on ECMO. Blood products for transport, replacing all fluids and drugs before transport. You've gotta have, and this is if, you know, if they're on heparin drips or if they're on um, various inotropes, that those, those drugs need to be full before you before you leave the hospital. Transport from and to preferring hospitals, so you gotta figure out again which ambulance is gonna take you and are they familiar with your process and what, you, what you're doing. And the oxygen should supply the um, out of town ambulances. So imponderables, um, some of the imponderables, in flight point of care testing, are you gonna be measuring ACTs and blood gases while you're en route? Cabin pressure and altitude, temperature management, we typically don't carry a heater cooler with you, so I'll show you what we use for that. Checklist and backup plans. Communication, I couldn't say that enough. O2 tank requirements, uh, sometimes patients require high flow and ECMO. So we're fortunate on our jet to have liquid oxygen, so uh, we're able to compensate for flows of 50, 60, 70 liters a minute, plus our ECMO circuit of 10 liters sometimes. And then the security of the equipment. Uh, how many bags, how many cannulas. We actually are able to store some of our cannulas um, outside uh, the, the cabin. So um, we had to figure out what temperatures that was gonna be, what 
how, how cold you can put a cannula in that environment and still use it. Uh, checklists are important. Um, that's the place for our cardio help sitting out on the tarmac. Um, this, is, this is Matt being funny, but uh, it was, it's, um, certainly drives home the point that you need checklists so you don't walk off and forget something you need. Just to point out just the way altitude affects gas exchange. Um, this is more or less just pointing out that, you know, when you go, and we usually travel around 20, 25,000 feet. Um, it can, you, their barometric pressure at 20,000 feet is 349. So the PO2 in the air uh, is around 73. PO2 of the alveoli is 40, so your saturation is 70 at 100%. But, the, you know, the, 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 this is certainly outside the plane. Um, there's actually a, a, a really good, um, paper that talks about um, you wouldn't you would really probably I never really knew what the average um, internal pressure of the aircraft would be but on average they did a they, they actually quoted a study the average cabin pressure of a fixed wing aircraft is around 7,000 feet so it decreases the partial pressure of oxygen from, from 107 to 60 so if they know going forward if you're getting on a plane uh, they can adjust the cabin pressure somewhat that that would help but um, the times that this has affected our patient saturations, they just, they were able to decrease their altitude and it brought our SATs up. This is our temperature management system. It's an emergency blanket. You can buy them at any Walmart. Uh, it works great. So, and it's cheap. They're about 25 cents. Emergencies. How to secure the ECMO cannula and tubing. Um, the best thing to do is to prepare the circuit and cannulas and the patient so that you don't have entrainment. How to prevent air entrainment onto an ECMO circuit. We use plunger caps or one-way valves on, our, on all of our stopcocks to decrease the risk of an air entrainment. How to salvage a circuit at 20,000 feet, where everybody's gonna be, what they're doing. Who's gonna hand crank, who's gonna be working on the circuit, um, that, those sort of things. Each person's role is important. Ground versus air. There's some differences there. Um, relatively easy as far as ground goes. It takes longer to get there, but you do, you saved a couple of patient transfers. Going from the plane to the um, visiting ambulance, from the hospital, from the ambulance, back to the plane. So it's a little bit, a little bit uh, more efficient as far as moving the patient, but the plane's a nice way to go because um, Again, they have better snacks and it doesn't take as long. The uh, cost is, is very expensive and you can go, um, it's variable with every aircraft, but you can go farther distances. Um, it, it depends on the patient. Is the patient stable enough for ground? Can they wait till you get there via ground? But more importantly, it's mainly based on the weather. So we've got two large ambulances that uh, seat up to four or five crew just in the rear of the ambulance and then you can put four crew up front. You can, we can go any, we usually max out about 125 miles. Anything farther than that, we usually take our jet. It's a, got to equipped with a portable generator and uh, gas. It's the inside of the ambulance. Lots of room. You got nurse, respiratory therapist, or either us. And then you got two seats here for, for other crew. So it's a pretty spacious thing. So our Citation Bravo. Um, this is a lot of fun, go pretty fast, go a long way, and when we, lucky enough, we've got two pilots, so it's pretty, pretty cool. Got liquid O2 on it, and we can seat four to five crew. Um, depending on the weight of the patient, we can take one or more perfusion team. Uh, depending on the weight of the patient and distance, we may have to just limit that to one person. But again, we do train our critical care transport team to hand crank and, and for emergency, so that's important. <coughs> Factors determining air versus ground transport, how big they are. If they're too big for, um, for us to put them on a plane, we usually take our ambulance. The geography, distance to referring hospital, availability of ambulance transfer to and from airport. You've got close proximity of the airport. Also the weather, so inclement weather can affect air travel, low ceilings and severe thunderstorms. And then of course tornadoes can affect um, ground travel. If they can fly, certainly around the, the weather, we, we tend to take the jet. 
you've got um, other things that are mechanical issues going on with an ambulance or aircraft will may determine what you take. Uh, if there's an ongoing trip, if that Citation Bravo or the of the or the Air Merit Hawker is not available, we will usually have to take an ambulance. ECMO staff, we have a physician, surgeon, perfusionist, um, ECMO specialist, transport RT and RN pilot. And, um, or CCT driver. This is our first trip. We went to Kentucky and picked this lady up. Uh, it was a success. She got transplanted uh, like two days after we got her there. Got her back to UAB. So this is our maiden voyage. This is our team. Got the surgeon over here holding my stuff. It was perfect. Uh, <laughs> this is us loaded in the plane. So um, to date, we've successfully transported 15 patients on ECMO, we transported from as closest area hospitals to as far away as Chicago, Illinois. These patients have been transferred to UAB for bridge to recovery, bridge to VAT, uh, bridge to transplant. What have we learned? You got to communicate, get a detailed HMP. You got to have extensive lab data, CT scans. You really don't, it's not really beneficial to transport someone that's had a stroke. So you need to get all this information before you leave. Efficient communication process in our hospital and the receiving hospital so that you can communicate all this information. ECMO program of the receiving hospital must be able to respond within a few hours to the consulted patient. The future, someone alluded to this earlier, this is uh, Subway in Paris where they're cannulating right there on the, on the, in, the in the subway. Um, so whether or not we or moving forward to this or home ECMO in the future uh, remains to be seen, but it's, to me, this is very exciting. Most people might think it's a little bit crude, but um, anyway, hopefully we'll get to see that in my lifetime. And that's it. If you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them. Check, check, check. Thank you, Britt. That was excellent. We have five minutes for questions.